My fellow YouTubers, we have just found a brand new way to get millions of views. So here is how it works. A company does a thing, anything, it doesn't really matter. The company just needs to get big and famous. Then a YouTuber comes along, let's call him Jake. He makes a video calling the company the most evil business in the world or literally a scam. He gets millions of views. Nice job. Our YouTuber has found the formula. He does it again and again and again. But uh-oh, now the YouTuber is getting big and famous himself. He's ripe for a takedown. So another YouTuber comes along. He makes a video calling the first YouTuber a scam. Or maybe he even uses Jake's own title against himself, which you have to say is pretty funny. The new YouTuber makes it big. And now he's ready to be taken down. Oh no, we got stuck in a loop, didn't we? This video is about the established titles controversy. Here's a brief summary in case you missed it because you were living under the open sky instead of spending your life on YouTube. This company, Established Titles, was sponsoring videos for a lot of big YouTubers. The problem was that their advertising was at best quite misleading. Established Titles made three main claims. Number one, you were buying the rights to a tiny plot of land in Scotland. Number two, based on an ancient Scottish custom, this gave you the right to call yourself a lord or a lady. And number three, they would plant a tree for its purchase. And since they were spending so much money promoting it, it seems like this product was very successful. Legal Eagle does a back of the envelope calculation and comes up with an estimation of $50 million in profit over the last three years. Yes, that probably means that over the last three years, they have revenue of roughly $100 million with profit easily exceeding $50 million. But look, that's just a guess. So a YouTuber comes along, a guy named Scott Schaefer, and he has a nice little present for us. Surprise! It's a takedown video on established titles, and it's a doozy. Turns out, you can't legally transfer ownership of such a tiny plot of land in Scotland. And even if you could, it wouldn't make you legally a lord in any real sense. Scott goes so far as saying there is no evidence that they are actually planting any trees. The only thing established titles does is donate money to an actual tree planting company called One Tree Planted. On top of that, they have never provided any evidence that they are actually donating money to back up their claims. So basically you have to take the company's word that they are really donating money to plant trees. But it seems like he was wrong about that. One of the charities these people work with, Trees for the Future, is generally regarded as a good, reputable charity. They have a sponsors page and established titles is listed among them and have credited them with planting 2 million trees. This clip was from a tiny channel called Conquista Media and his video is titled Established titles isn't a scam, you're just stupid. The thumbnail is a picture of Scott's face. So it didn't take long after Scott's viral takedown video for people to start taking aim at him. And on YouTube, if you can't call someone a scam, you can always say they are manipulating the audience, omitting facts, lying, or just plain bad at their job. I'm not a researcher by any stretch of the imagination, and yet in mere minutes I found proof, hard proof, which is enough to contest, if not debunk your claims. The established title takedown video really blew up Scott's channel. Only a month ago, he was making some videos with only 9,000 views. Now, in only a couple weeks, his takedown video has 2.6 million views. And he already got over 600k and 300k on his two follow-ups. He got more views on those three videos than in the entire history of his channel, which was created four years ago. That's insane, because Scott got started by making a very different style of video with titles such as Make Money Drawing Lines, super easy way to make money online. In this video, I'm gonna show you how you can make some money just scribbling a couple of lines on your computer screen. That's all you have to do, nothing else. Anyone can do this to start making some money. You can be 60, you can be 16, you can be retired, you can be in high school. Anyone can use this to start making some side income. But those videos were not getting the views. He even started a super wholesome side channel where he made videos about a topic he's clearly passionate about, Star Wars. The Duro species was one of the very first alien races of Star Wars. But those videos performed even worse. So it's only in the past few months that Scott found the magic formula for success on YouTube. Step one, use some flames as the background of your thumbnail. Step two, put Graham Stephen's face on there. Seriously, in the last four months, Scott has made six separate videos with Graham face in the thumbnail. Even on videos where Graham is barely mentioned, like the established title one, he is on the thumbnail and in the title. But he's not even the main target. 
In the same time frame, Scott has no less than 22 videos about Meet Kevin. To be clear, I have nothing against Scott in particular and I'm not trying to criticize him. He's just doing what works. It would be like making fun of a gaming YouTuber for playing Minecraft too much. You make videos, they don't get views. You try something else and it starts working and so you do more and more of what works. In his channel description, probably written in more optimistic times, Scott announces, My name is Scott Schaefer, and this channel is about helping people. And now, he has over a dozen videos about some other YouTubers DUI. I'm not sure exactly who those videos are supposed to be helping, but they're certainly entertaining people since they keep clicking. So Scott found something that worked, he made a good video, and it blew up. Good for him. Scott is just a great example to illustrate how the incentives work here on YouTube. Scott tried to do some different types of videos, but YouTube sent him a very clear message that he was wasting his time. What works is controversy. Even Coffeezilla, the godfather of all scam hunters, started with a very different style of videos on his first channel, Coffee Break. He covered topics like how humans are crowdsourcing a cure to COVID-19 in his last video over two years ago. And those videos did pretty well but they probably took a lot of time and effort to make. He realized it was much easier to get views on his second channel, where he could churn out several videos a week talking about the latest scam. And look, you'd be silly to blame any of these guys. They're just doing what gets rewarded on the platform, like the rest of us YouTubers. Like me, I mean, I'm literally chasing the established title's trend right now. My point is that the scam hunters mostly didn't dream of exposing Ponzi schemes when they were little boys and girls. They wanted to be creative and for people to care about their ideas. But YouTube doesn't care about any of our feelings. What works is negativity, scandal, and famous people in the thumbnail. You do what works and you enjoy the views and the AdSense money, or you don't and you make Star Wars videos that no one watches until you give up. Every time a video blows up, especially if it's from a small channel, you can be sure dozens of others will rush to copy that exact formula. That's why you've seen so many videos with exact same title, like why I left BuzzFeed. And for that one to work, you actually had to have been at BuzzFeed. The barrier to entry is much lower for the formula Scott has shown us. All you need to do is pick a company that has sponsored some big YouTubers and find something bad to say about that company. If you can't call them a scam, call them stupid or overpriced, or say that the product is bad, or make fun of people who buy this type of thing. But try as best as you can to use the magic word, scam. The good news is that the company doesn't need to be a literal scam. On the internet, the bar for a scam is as low as a product that doesn't seem worth it to you personally. So bottled water is a scam, why not? Apple is a scam. Feminism is a scam. I came to the conclusion that feminism, that whole group of people, is just an absolute scam. Here's the trick. Any company that advertises on YouTube obviously has money to spend on marketing. So they have some margin, meaning that they sell their product for more than it costs to produce. This means that you can call this product overpriced. And if something is judged overpriced on the internet, it's a scam. Or at least you can call it that in your title, which is all that matters. Now, it's worth pointing out that this is not a correct use of the word. A scam is not just a product that is too expensive or not worth it. A scam should involve the seller lying about their product. So established titles is not a scam because they sell you a piece of paper calling you a lord or lady for a ludicrous amount of money. They are only a scam insofar as some of their ads imply that you will own a plot of land and legally be a lord or lady, which is untrue. And of course, some scam hunters will care about that nuance. But those that want to make it big fast will push the word scam to its absolute limit. Scott himself is already stretching the truth in his title. In what sense was established titles YouTube's biggest con? I mean, come on. Do you remember that the FTX collapse happened just last month where people lost billions of dollars and FTX was promoted all over YouTube? There is just no reasonable way to argue that established titles was ever YouTube's biggest scam. But that's just a title, right? And it worked, so it will be copied all around. Every week, some aspiring scammer hunter will come up with the next biggest scan on YouTube. We've actually seen it happen before. In the beginning, vlogging was just people taking their camera to Starbucks or doing laundry or whatever. And then Casey came along and leveled up the format with better editing and storytelling. And then, 
a new generation of vloggers realized that they could engineer their life to make it more interesting. The Paul brothers, David Dobrik and others competed for the craziest titles and thumbnails. Stunts became more and more extreme until it went completely off the rails. Logan Paul went into the suicide forest. Jeff Wittek got seriously injured during the filming of a David Dobrik video. And then there were the sexual assault allegations surrounding the vlog squad. I'm sure there were a lot of vloggers who were careful and never crossed the line. But it's not a coincidence that the most successful ones were the ones who chased those incentives off a cliff. And you were also involved in the YouTube demonetization wave that hit yeah. after that mm -hmm. Pootie Pie cocksucker decided it was a good idea to use the N-word on uh, video game streams. Joe Rogan, please. Joe, please. I may be a cocksucker, Joe. You got me there. But I didn't create the apocalypse. This is a common misconception that happens all the time. In 2017, the first apocalypse happened. There was a controversy around PewDiePie, who was the biggest YouTuber at the time. And although PewDiePie didn't cause the apocalypse, it's likely that this gave some journalists a brilliant idea. So they went to YouTube and pulled up a bunch of extremist videos, trying to get some ads to show up. When some did, they kept refreshing the page until they saw an ad from a big brand like L'Oreal. Bingo, they got their article. YouTube hate preachers share screens with household names. Uh, some inflammatory articles are posted about how major brands are being advertised on top of very vile YouTube videos. A bunch of advertisers fearing backlash removed their ads entirely from YouTube. And during this period, every YouTuber saw a decrease in revenue. The journalists were following their incentive. Number one, get clicks. Number two, hurt Google and the other tech companies that are slowly killing the old newspaper industry. Brands didn't want to take the risk of appearing in a negative article, so they pulled their ads. And the ones who got hurt were YouTubers who saw their ad revenue plummet. But most importantly, YouTube got much more strict about monetization after that. Before that time, all kinds of content could be monetized. After the first apocalypse, it became all about family-friendly content. And the impact is felt to this day. YouTubers are still struggling with their videos being demonetized for the smallest infractions, often by mistake and without any explanation. But there was still a safer way to make money. Brand deals. You never know if a video could be demonetized. But if you have a brand integration, you can at least guarantee that the video you spent days working on will make at least some revenue. So what happens if an army of wannabe scam hunters learns that you can manufacture a viral video by criticizing a sponsor and putting some big YouTuber's face in a thumbnail? Do sponsors decide to pull back? You might think that it would be a good thing, that only scam companies would be afraid of the scrutiny. But I'm not so sure. After all, even the most clean cut of YouTubers lost revenue during the apocalypse. Legit brands could have kept advertising on legit channels, but they felt it wasn't worth the risk. Also, as we've seen, people on the internet are not too careful with their use of the word scam. Sure, if someone calls you a scam with little evidence, people who watch the video might walk away unconvinced. But that doesn't matter because click-through rate on YouTube are usually lower than 5%. That means that if a takedown video on your company gets 100,000 views, there are another 2 million people who have seen the thumbnail calling you a scam. And when one of these people goes to your website to purchase, they will vaguely remember that they saw something somewhere about you being a scam and they'll be just less likely to buy. This effect could very easily overwhelm whatever brand affinity was built by the sponsorship in the first place because more people will see the negative thumbnail and a sponsorship segment buried in a video. Two, negative information sticks in our mind much more easily. And three, people will become more skeptical about sponsorships in general. And I've seen lots of comments to the effect that the viewer just automatically assumes that everything any YouTuber promotes is just dreck. Not every brand will get a takedown video made about them. And not all those videos that do get made will go viral. But the risk has just gone up exponentially. Even for legit brands who just sell their products at a good margin, which describes most YouTube sponsors. Actually, maybe those legit brands should be even more scared than the scammers. Because if you look at the way established titles reacted to the controversy, it's almost like they were expecting to get exposed at some point. They just instantly gave up, stopped all advertising and offered refunds to all their customers. They can do that because they never really cared in the first place. They have a bunch of other companies to fall back on, or they can just spin up another scheme next week until that one gets called out too. But imagine an entrepreneur who poured blood, sweat and tears into his company for years. He would take it much harder if someone publicly called him a scam. Running ads on YouTube would be like running for office. Thousands of very motivated people will crawl through everything you have ever done 
looking for anything negative they can say about you. And even if they don't find anything, they can probably get hundreds of thousands of views just calling your product an overpriced piece of crap. They'll call it an honest review, not sponsored. As a company, if you're arguing with YouTubers about a video, you've already lost, even if the video was factually wrong. The only thing people will remember is that you're vaguely shady, and that risk is completely asymmetrical. The likelihood that someone will make a takedown video has gone up, but the chance that someone will make an unpaid positive video about your product is still about zero, even if they did it wouldn't get views. At the same time, if a brand sticks to advertising on Facebook or Instagram, it can mostly avoid that risk. On YouTube, stories about YouTubers work best. If Scott's video had been titled The Internet's Biggest Con and had not included some famous YouTubers in the thumbnail, it would not have gone viral in the same way. From now on, whenever a company does a big push of sponsorships on YouTube, they are putting a target on their backs. So the math tells me that the expected value of brand sponsorships just went down significantly. And just so I don't get called biased, this won't affect me in any way. Who am I kidding? They wrote the negative comments and left 10 minutes ago anyways. But I will still say that I have never done a brand deal and I have no plans to ever start. So don't think I'm complaining or saying that scam hunters should stop. That would be like asking people to stop making true crime documentaries or reality TV shows or sugary cereal for kids. As long as there is demand, people will make those things. That's fine. My point is that the phenomenon of scam hunters is relatively new and they are experiencing unprecedented growth right now thanks to the established titles controversy and also the FTX fiasco. Lots of people will copy the formula and that means some actual scams will get exposed as well as some collateral damage. My prediction is that the impact over the YouTube ecosystem over the next few years could be much bigger than anyone expects. If this comes true, we could be heading towards a new apocalypse and this one would hit a source of revenue that had previously been safe, brand deals. Hey, did you know this was my second video ever on this channel? I can only get better from here, so subscribe if you liked it, and share the video with your friends so they know you found me first. Also, click here if you want to see my video about the real biggest con on YouTube, the FTX collapse, and why no one saw it coming. Cheers.